Uh, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Wait, I'm still like figuring out the technical, which is not my strongest area. <laughs> you look good. You're, you're like a little off center. Okay. So okay. scoot a little. Maybe I can scoot. There we go. Okay. Maybe okay. a little more. Maybe a little okay. more. Okay. 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 Wait. wait, okay. wait. Oh, no, that's not good. Okay, there we wait, go. Wait. wait. <laughs> there. There. And now pull it down a little, a little more. Okay. 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 Great. There we go. Yay. <laughs> How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I am so good. Thank you again for being here and joining the show. I, I created the show in March of 2020 when COVID just shut the whole world down because I wanted people to have a place every week where they can come and just have fun and hear from the people that they love like yourself. So it's great to have you. Oh my gosh. Yeah. You were, you were providing a huge service. We were so isolated and freaking out. So <laughs> thank you for creating community for us. Oh, listen, I'm all about community. It's my little part of, of doing what I can. And for <laughs> everybody tuned in, I have fan questions as well. I'll be asking fan questions towards the end of the interview. So stick around for that. But I mean, if you're ready to rock, we have a lot to get to. Okay. Awesome. Let me just turn up the volume because I can't hear you well. I'm so yeah. sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Turn it all the way up. <laughs> okay. Okay. I okay. I can hear you well enough. All right. You feeling good? Yeah. Okay. Good. So <laughs> first off, I've got to say a huge congratulations to you on all of the success with Grey's Anatomy. I mean, 18 seasons in, 19th season is coming. People are so excited. This is like comfort food for the soul this show. So I want to bring it all the way back for a minute, all the way back to when you first got that script for private practice, right? Yeah. What was it that attracted you to wanting to be a part of this, you know, Shondaland medical universe to begin with? Yeah. Oh my gosh. I mean, so many things. First of all, I tell this anecdote all the time. And so I will share it with you if you want to about, I had seen the first episode, I had seen the first season of Grey's Anatomy when I was in undergrad. I was at uh, Trinity College in Toronto uh, at U of T. And um, I had, during finals, I had watched the first season of Grey's Anatomy and was just like, what is this? <laughs> what is this? It was like the pilot was so perfect. The structure was so gorgeous. The characters were so well thought out. And, and it was like, it was surprising. Like what they were showing uh, in terms of like the complexities of the characters and the storylines was surprising in a way that um, I loved. And I got to the end of watching uh, the first season. And I, again, I was like in my last year of undergrad and I was like, I think I want to go to med school. And so I went to the medical faculty at U of T and I, they had this like six week lecture series for arts and science students who wanted to maybe go into medicine and like how you would do that transition. And so I went to this lecture series. It was at the medical faculty in these like huge lecture halls. And it was essentially surgeons coming every week and um, explaining like what they actually do in a day. Like I wake up and I do this and this is, these are scans and this is what surgery is. And I got to the end of the lecture series and I kind of was like, Oh, I don't, I don't think I want to be a doctor. I think that I just want to be on Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> and so I like picked up and moved to LA and it's a, it's a bit more of a meandering story than that. But essentially I ended up in LA on Grey's Anatomy and that, wow. <laughs> so, so how did that audition even come about for you? Like, what was that process like? Did you go out yeah. a million auditions for it? Did you even audition for other roles in the Grey's Anatomy universe? Like, how did this happen? Uh, I didn't audition for other roles. I, I, and I honestly, it was so long ago. What I remember was going into Linda Lowy's office. Uh, shout out to Linda Lowy, by the way. What a genius. Oh my God. <laughs> In terms of like the whole show and all of the Shondaland shows that she cast. Um, I mean, she really has like created all of my friends for me here in Los Angeles, <laughs> which is great. Um, uh, but uh, I walked into the, I walked into the office. I must have gone to, I must have gone to an audition before that, that I'm not remembering well. But I remember walking in and Shonda was sitting there in the chair. This is a while ago. <laughs> <laughs> and so Shonda was in the room and, um, uh, and I did the audition and there was kind of like this moment of silence after I did the scene and Shonda kind of was sitting back and she said, 
I think I could like you. <laughs> and I said, I think I could like you too. Oh, God. And then that was it. And I got the call and <laughs> Amelia Shepard 12 years later. <laughs> That's incredible. Oh my God. Also like no pressure, Shonda sitting in the audition room. That's probably totally. like this big of a room, right? Yeah. Yeah. It was, I, but thankfully I did not understand at that time the full scope of like Shonda's titanness in this world. Right, <laughs> so, right. Yeah. That is so cool. Okay, so after private practice in mm -hmm. about 2014, I want to say you joined Grace full time, right? Yeah. So did you see that coming? Like, were there conversations ahead of time? Like, listen, we're gonna move you over? Or was it kind of a shock? Uh, there, there actually were. Um, uh, Sean and I had talked about it. Um, and with Betsy, like a year before, um, but I had just had my baby. And so my first baby, I had just had Eliza. And, um, and so I had had her when I was on private practice. Um, and that was like the, that was, I was pregnant with my first daughter the year that Amelia had her like very tragic pregnancy. And so they kind of wrote the pregnancy in that way, um, although it went a very different way. Um, and so after that, we kind of talked about maybe Amelia coming over. And at that time I was home, I was, I was newly home with my baby and needed a bit of a break. Um, and so, um, we kind of waited and then like I think the next it was the next season that um that Amelia ended up coming to Grace. Ah well <laughs> let's talk about Amelia for a minute because this character I mean she's like multi-layered she's so interesting there's so much going on with her she's a badass she's everything and more um and I feel like the fandom caught on very quickly with her like she was an instant fan favorite so how would you describe her evolution from day one all the way to now? I mean, <laughs> I mean, she's lived a whole life yeah. uh, on screen. And I think, I think, and I'm, the, I'll use this as a segue to talk about one of the things I love so much about this show and Shondaland in general is that we, uh, I don't think in, uh, in this way ever in the history of television, have we watched the lives of characters unfold so completely and go from like students and kind of like cultish interns to like uh, surgeons who are at the top of their game to like becoming people who are capable of teaching the next generation and, and especially women, like watching women go from, um, you know, what would have traditionally been like the ingenue time of life, like the maiden time of life and then maturing into the full flower of their professionalism and their authority and, uh, and their womanhood and in some cases their motherhood and really becoming the hearth at which like the next generation comes to learn. And so, um, so I think our show has done that with so many different characters, especially Meredith. And I mean, so many characters, but that's something we've, we've gotten to see with Amelia. She kind of started on private practice and Grey's the same year. Actually, she was doing guest spots on Grey's when she started as a regular on private practice, but she was uh, still a fellow. She was doing a fellowship at that time. And, uh, and she kind of was very lost and uh, looking for a place and a home. And she found that with Addison. Uh, who's her sister-in-law, her, her first sister-in-law. <laughs> and, um, and she started living with Addison uh, and working in the private practice over on that show. Um, and then she, yeah, moved over to Gray's and became the chief of uh, neurosurgery and is now kind of doing her thing over, over in Seattle and in Minnesota right now. <laughs> so what do you love? What do you love about playing her? Oh, God. Um, uh, <laughs> everything. I, I, I love Amelia Shepard like she is my sister family member. Like, uh, a, like as an actor, you don't often have an opportunity to, to play a character for so many years and to see them not only, not only to create their psyche uh, right off the bat, which you get to do, which is so awesome. And they gave her so much depth and, uh, She's so multifaceted. And so I got to kind of dig into that immediately, which was such a privilege and the writers are just genius. And, um, but then to see her encounter her environment over many years and see how the character that they created and that I created with them uh, is affected 
by the different events that happen in their lives and how it sends them in this direction or in that direction. Like she really becomes like a human being, like someone else in your family or in your friendship group uh, or your chosen family that you, you, you watch becoming in the world and, and creatively encountering circumstances and, and unfolding in this very dynamic way. And so I just, I, 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 it's hard to articulate. I love her like I love a human being, not for one reason, but because she's uh, alive to me. Yeah, well, it comes through and I imagine playing somebody to your point for that long is so fulfilling because it does give you room to really explore a character, right? In all different chapters of their lives. Like I love, I know it's controversial, many opinions, but I love it just like that because it's their chapters in their 50s. And what is true <laughs> for people to see that, you know? Mm -hmm. I yeah, so cool. exactly. That we're not static. Like, yeah. again, like we're coming out of the generation that grew up with like the type of Disney films where like life ended at, you know, I, I do. <laughs> and it's like, well, okay, wait, wait, wait. But then what happens? Like there's right. a whole, there's so much more to everyone's life that we weren't invited to participate in, um, in kind of traditional film and TV. And now I think, I think in streaming and in cable, and uh, we're just kind of deconstructing all of that, like um, uh, the kind of modern narrative, and we're getting into like postmodern uh, yeah. storytelling. And uh, yeah, I think so Kate cool. Underland is a great example of that. It's it's so cool. I'm I'm here for it. And I love it. Um, now I know this is probably the hardest question in the world, but when you think back at all of your amazing work, what are some scenes and moments for your character that are like super special you'll always remember them and they'll be a part of you forever yeah oh good question um whew, there's so many um okay i think i i can think of scenes that stand out and then storylines that stand out so one storyline that was fantastic for amelia um, i mean obviously her addiction storyline on private practice where she, you know, hit another, she had gotten sober young and then she went to med school and Johns Hopkins and uh, uh, had really kind of gotten herself together and, and really thrived in medicine. Um, and then she uh, went out. And so she, um, she slipped in her sobriety and had this like very devastating uh, storyline on private practice and then ended up in uh, rehab after an intervention. And so obviously that storyline was huge for her and really fun to play um although very tragic um but then after that on Grays, i think the herman storyline that i did with um gina davis where gina davis had that like really um uh profoundly complicated tumor and uh amelia came in and, and figured out a way to remove the tumor and save her life and she had to kind of do this presentation in front of many many people and i think that some of the superhero uh stuff came out of that storyline and um and i think that was where amelia really came into her authority mm. as a woman and as a surgeon and she kind of left behind the uh, mantle that her family had given her of like, you're kind of the, you know, the, the black sheep and the uh, wayward kid who's always messing up. And I think that was where she kind of finally got to let go of that identity a little bit and go, you know what, like, yes, I made mistakes as I was growing up. And that was part of my process. And look at where I have arrived and look at where that, the wisdom that that has given me and the, and the tenacity and the resilience that has given me. And, and now I am in a position to give that back to the world. And that's really profound creative way so that one and then I think when Derek died that uh, scene on the back porch with Owen uh, where she's like again contemplating um going out and she's really not in a good place uh, in terms of her mental health um and then she has to learn to grieve she has to grieve and that that ability for her to grieve fully um really uh saved her from relapse Right. You know what I mean? She wasn't pushing down the feelings and she wasn't running from the feelings or hiding from the feelings. And so having the opportunity to actually feel them instead of running from them helped her to not do drugs. You know yeah. what I mean? And that's something I think that's a really important thing for people to understand about addiction yeah. um, and grief. All solid choices. Good scenes. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> nice scenes. Um, 
we gotta talk about love for a minute. Yeah. There's a certain, <laughs> kiss, certain little kiss that happened. Little. A little kiss, a little, little something something. I think you know exactly what I'm talking about with Dr. Kai now. Yeah. This kiss, people were waiting for and waiting for, I feel like, all season long. So what has it been like exploring this storyline um, for you? And also getting to explore Amelia's sexuality, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the storyline has been so fun. Yeah. First of all, I think that the build of the story has been gorgeous. Like, mm -hmm. the fact that, like, the very first episode where they met each other, it was, like, just this, like, energetic tension. And that it kind of really grew through their connection uh, through science. I mean, they're both of them are so passionate about um, brains and neurology and brain science. And, and that kind of shared passion uh, just kind of developed in this, like, really, really slow burn way which I'm so grateful that the writers like gave us that uh, groundedness and the respect of like us building it over time. So that was wonderful. Um, and obviously ER Fight Master is amazing and it's such a privilege to work with them. They're uh, such a great actor and just a great vibe on set. Like anytime they walk onto the set, everyone is immediately like, <sighs> <laughs> they're so fun um uh and like they keep it light and fun but they're also very professional and obviously very talented um and so that's been really fun and then in terms of exploring um Amelia's sexuality I think one of the one of the things that ha has been like debated online people weren't aware uh of kind of what her how she identified or what her sexuality was but Actually, she was written originally as a queer character in that first mm. episode on Private Practice. Uh, the Originally, in that first script, she was in a relationship with the professor that she was doing a fellowship with. Um, and for whatever reason, I think time or whatever, some of the lines that indicated that didn't make it to the final cut. But she mm. was always conceived of as, as a queer character. Um, and so, and I think we have kind of like tipped our hat to it throughout the series. She's been married to, obviously she was married to Owen and uh, she's been in a relationship with Link. Um, uh, but she, uh, you know, had a crush on Karina and I think people have been talking about that. Like she's, she's, she's always been queer. And, right. um, and so I think this is, we finally have an opportunity to see it on screen. And that's, that's really nice. Yeah, it's super exciting. And the fans' response, I mean, were you blown away by how excited people were? I mean, yeah. It was, it, what was so nice was that um, you really felt that, uh, that people were, like, hungry for this representation. And yeah. they were hungry to see Amelia, again, who they've had a relationship with for 12 years and who, you know, uh, this... Uh, part of her sexuality has been like mentioned but not explored. Uh, they were hungry to see that like play out. Um, and, and that it's being played out, I think in a really beautiful grounded way. Again, like Dr. Kai Bartley is not just a, you know, like a love interest. They, they are a character who has their own career and their own um, uh, perspective and their own, you know, talents and groundedness. And, and so, um, so to have two kind of significant characters who are exploring this re relationship, uh, and to have like, uh, that, that kind of representation happening, I think is, I, everybody's so excited about it. And I think I mentioned in another interview, like <laughs> watching the reaction videos, like we get sent like we get tagged and all of the TikTok stuff. And, and so watching the reaction videos of like young fans uh, finally getting that kiss. Um, it's been really, really, really sweet and really wonderful. I think it, 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 warms, it warms our hearts. <laughs> yeah, well, I know people are very excited to see what's going to come next with that. But um, on the same vein of love, I saw a lot of comments also asking about link and how it's like working with chris and if you think there's any chance down the road they will rekindle anything or is amelia in a different place like what are your thoughts what's going on well let's i don't know i mean 
it's Grey's Anatomy, so anything can happen at any time. Um, really? You know, I think in the, oh, let's see what happens in the next episode. Obviously, Link is not thrilled right now. <laughs> <laughs> Link is not thrilled. Um, but Amelia is not thrilled with how Link has been behaving, honestly. I mean, he, really, I think what happened for Amelia at kind of the end of that, of their, the most recent end of their relationship is that I think Amelia really recognized that Link had an idea about how she fit into his life um, that didn't see her fully, that didn't see her. It was like a, she was supposed to fulfill a role in his life as opposed to kind of like looking at her and engaging with her and being like, well, how, how do you see your life unfolding? And what would, what would our relationship be if we were kind of, um, you know, walking together through life like kind of reducing it to to roles that had to be in his case like a traditional marriage i think just like opened her eyes to the fact that he was not able to witness her in the way that she needed mm -hmm. um and that's something that kai so far has been very clearly doing like they see her um and so i don't know where the writers will take it in the future um but I think it is an important story that we're telling, yeah. that we're talking about in terms of like, again, this kind of like Disney make-believe idea of like roles that we inherited, that, we, that so many people are so focused on like achieving um, and kind of breaking that down and being like, well, what are we doing? What are we actually doing? Where do you find connection? Where do you find love? Where do you find witness? Um, and right now, Amelia is finding that with Kai. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I know from the messages I received that people are so eager for the show to return this week, right? On the 24th? Yes. And they want to see what's coming. So are there any teases you can give about the episode or about the season? Any little breadcrumbs you can leave us? Ooh. Well, I think we know from... I think we know from the trailer that Link has not had his say <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> about how he feels <laughs> about uh, the romantic situation. And so in this next episode, yeah, they are going to kind of, they're going to get into it a little bit. And, um, mm. uh, and so we will see how that pans out. Um, and then what happens? And, uh, well, and then we've got the surgery. We have this huge, this huge surgery. We're like trying to cure Parkinson's. That's like a very, very big deal. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and so, um, so I think we're getting more into that. What else is happening? I think I'm mean, that. That's what I can kind of give you right now for this okay. for this next episode. All right, we'll take that. We'll take yeah. that. We're very excited for it. The impact that the show has had, I mean, it's global, as you know. It reaches everyone, everywhere. Everybody can relate to it in some way, shape, or form. Um, what do you think is so special about this show that it has acquired this worldwide fandom? Like, why does it speak to so many people? Okay. It's a big question. Hmm. The one that the, the answer that I usually give to a question sort of around this is that the characters are so well fleshed out that we develop relationships with them. Like I was saying for Amelia and, and me, uh, they become real people in our lives. And, uh, and kind of that speaks to the longevity of the show. I think they're so real that we're not like, okay, well, it's been four seasons. Now I don't want to know what's going on in my friend's life. We're like, whoa, it's been four seasons. Now, now what are you going to do? What job are you going to take? Where are you going to move to? Like, we don't, we don't want to lose track of our friends just because right. a certain amount of time has been allotted. And then I think when it comes to the international scope of it, again, I think that Shonda's done a fantastic job of deconstructing assumptions um uh and in that way uh, again there's kind of like a there's kind of a queerness to the whole show right like like it it reaches people at a level that kind of deconstructs and unpacks um 
dualities and binaries and, and like this is who is supposed to be doing this and this is who is supposed to be doing that. Like it, it, it gets kind of inside of the characters and inside of the psyches of um, our communities and our culture in a way that deconstructs them and makes us question assumptions that we've always had, right? right. And so, um, so I think no matter where you're from, it's able to reach a core part of you that is outside of nationality and that is outside of gender and is outside of um, uh, socioeconomic status. Like it's, it's really, um, it, it is a show that it's fundamentally about a diversity of thinking. Uh, yeah. That, that I think appeals to every single human being, which is why it's able to move the needle in so many ways and become inclusive for so many people. It's like obvious, like when you see the dynamicness of each human being, why would you exclude them? Right. Right? It doesn't make any sense. Like, right. and so I think our show really reaches like a soul level um, of people all over the world. Yeah, it's cool because it reaches so many different age groups as well. Yeah. And the things the show tackles are quite often the types of content you see on streamers and not necessarily prime time, right? And I think it's so cool that your show that's so widely available to people is tackling a lot of these issues, you know? Yeah, yeah, and it, it, you're right. It's like, it, it rides this really fine line of uh, being, um, like boundary crossing and like um, groundbreaking, but yeah. also accessible. Yes, yeah, hundred percent. You know, yeah. and I love that. I love that it's not we're not we're not talking at a uh, in a way that um, it's just it's it's like it's comforting to everyone while also being challenging. Yes, and so that combination I think pe keeps people tuning in. Oh, 100%. That's why it's had such a long life and will continue to live on. It's, it's got something for everyone. Um, let me get to some of these fan questions. Now, these were some of the most popular questions I received in my when I announced you <laughs> okay. as my guest. So the ones that kept popping up, okay? okay? Number one, what is your favorite behind the scenes moment with Dr. Guy? <laughs> oh, I mean, that's so hard. I mean, we're like, <laughs> we hang out all the time. So I mean, the one I talked about on when I talked about on Twitter a little while ago, and everybody was asking was um, <laughs> was about um, ice chip basketball, and everyone was like, "What ice chip basketball?" So I guess I'll give give that away on this, which is um, <laughs> it's, it's, so there's this craft service table now that we are in COVID, and it's it's a whole different system than we're used to. But there happens to be this huge like tray of, there's like all of these pieces of ice and there's this like red metal pole that's like this big, like it's not big at all. <laughs> and um, and we developed a game where we just take ice chips from afar and like try to get it in the opening of the hole in the pole. And it's kind of caught on, and it's a very uh, idle pastime <laughs> while we're waiting to set up the lights. We do that. <laughs> nice. <laughs> One okay. of the things we do. <laughs> all right, all right, we'll take that. You have got to something here. Do I have any poles and ice around here? I might have to try that later. <laughs> That's interesting. Um, next question. Did you worry, I thought this was interesting. Did you worry that people wouldn't understand Amelia without having seen private practice? I did worry about that. You did? Yes, I did worry about that. Uh, to the point that I was like, can we bring some of the flashbacks into Grey's Anatomy? Um, and I think initially when she came on, she was quite like, I think people didn't understand like the level of trauma that she clearly had right. <laughs> um, because a lot of them hadn't seen private practice, but she had just like gone through a relapse. And I mean, her father was like murdered in front of her when she was five years old. And uh, from there, there was just like more and more tragedy, you know, and she'd gone through like a very hard rock bottom as a teenager. And then obviously had lost her 
boyfriend to an overdose in her bed and then she was pregnant with his baby who was anencephalic and so she lost that baby too. I mean it's just like this parade of trauma yeah. um and so by the time she came to Grace, yeah she was she was holding in a lot <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um and so I worried about that but I think one of the nice things is they're very patient on Grays. You expect there to be a bit of a like, who's this new person? This is not one of my friends that I already have. And so you kind of expect a little bumpiness. And then um, I think a lot of people, especially during the pandemic, have gone back and watched private practice. Yeah, yeah. I'm hearing a lot of that. And so I think people are now fully understanding how fleshed out um, that, that story is and appreciating kind of Amelia's resilience, actually, on the show, on this show, on Grays. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I couldn't agree more. Um, okay, a couple more. Is there a cast member you would still like to see return to the series from Private Practice and from Grey's? All of them from Private Practice. Well, from, okay, from, from Private Practice, we're, let me be clear. The whole cast of Private Practice, we're all best friends. <laughs> I love that. We love each other so much, and we have a text chain that is ongoing. I was texting with Paul this morning. Like, we, we, we are genuinely, we love each other. And we go for dinner at each other's houses, and we, like, go around the table and, like, fill each other in on what is happening. And for birthdays and, like, anytime something hard happens, like, it's that group of people that checks in with each other and um, it is delightful. So I would bring any of the private practice people over to Grey's Anatomy. Um, we just had Kate uh, Addison come over and that was wonderful, but I would take any of them. So then let's see, Grey's, who would I bring back? Oh God, I mean, we're limited by character death. Right. Um, I mean, I still, like, as a fan, the death of Lexi Gray destroyed me. Mm. <laughs> Kyla was so brilliant. Yeah. And so I would love for her to come back. Um, Sarah Drew uh, is one of my good friends. Love her so much. I would love to have her come back. Oh, gosh. I mean, yeah, as a fan, so many people, but many of them are, many of them are dead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that can be a little tricky, but good suggestions otherwise. I love that. Yeah. Um, two more fan questions. Okay. Let's see. Uh, sh oh, I like this one. What was one of the most surprising twists in the entire series for you where you read that and were like, whoa. I know this. The most surprising twist for me was when we found out, was when we found out that Owen, who I'd been married to for a while, and had also been married to Christina, that we found out that he had a sister that we did not know about, and she had been kidnapped by the Taliban. That was, uh, a, that was, a, that was, that was a pretty big surprise. Yeah. <laughs> I, that was a plot twist. Didn't know about yeah. that. <laughs> There's a lot to unpack in that sentence. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. But uh, Abigail is doing such a great job with that character, and so we're very we're very grateful that she was rescued. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fair enough. That's a good one. I, I, I would say that's surprising. Yes. Um, last fan question. Da, 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 da. What was the most difficult scene for you to film ever in the history of the show? In the history of Grey's Anatomy. Yes. Difficult scene. Oh, different, different definitions of difficult. Um, or emotional, difficult or emotional. Like it just took a lot. I mean, I have to say when Derek died, this is like getting into like the interstices of the process a little bit, but like, uh, I had been I had been working even though I was on private practice as Amelia that relationship between Amelia and Derek was so profound for her again like he had been there in the store when their father was shot in front of them and so uh they had shared this like moment of unbelievable trauma 
Uh, and then after that, he became kind of a father figure for her. Her sisters were not <laughs> emotionally very supportive. And she kind of replaced her father with Derek in a lot of ways. And then obviously they both became neurosurgeons. And uh, he, he was such an anchor in her uh, identity and sense of self and her attachment in the world, like in terms of like attachment wounds, like he was, her mother was devastated after that death and was not available to her emotionally. And her dad was dead. Derek was core for her. And so when he, I'm like feeling emotional now, <laughs> when he died, like I had created so, such a, an intricate psychological map for uh, Amelia using Derek uh, as like her core memories that when he died, like I as an actor, as a character, obviously was like annihilated. But then as an actor too, it was like, it was, it broke my brain. Like it was, it was so devastating uh, for her to lose that person. Uh, yeah, that, that was hard. That was hard. Wow, I think that's really an interesting perspective we don't often hear about, too, as a human being, what that does to you. It's so You're so invested, right? It's so emotional. Yeah. Yeah, because, because the mind is a funny thing. Like, what we're doing as actors, again, you're, like, creating these, these memories and these, like, dreamscapes. But, like, in terms of your unconscious mind, like it's a little blurry about what your emotional of what your nervous system knows to be real and what your nervous, like your conscious brain is like, ah, obviously I know, but, um, but you, you do create a, a emotional memory that is in your body. And so like losing somebody that core that you've been working with for so many years, like it feels there are levels of it that feel real. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's super, super interesting. A really different perspective on it all. I, I love that. Um, switching gears, I have a few more questions. I know I'm keeping you a little longer. Do you have five minutes or so? Yeah. All right. Cool. All right. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. Um, I, so many people, I mean, the most striking thing to me when I announced you last night as my guest were the DMs saying how inspired people are by you because you stand for inclusion and representation and a direct quote, everything right in the world. Um, which is really, really cool to see. And I know that on a personal level, you quite often speak about Down syndrome and having your beautiful daughter and you shed a really beautiful light on what it's like, right? Raising a family and, and um, with Down syndrome. So for you, why did you want to open up about that? And what do you hope sharing your story will do for other people? Because it is a very personal thing. Yeah. Um, I think think I think like with Grey's Anatomy and like uh, why the stories are so compelling on Grey's Anatomy I think uh, I think one of the things that I realized because again I, I had kept my uh, family life very very private before uh, before Pippa my second daughter who does have Down syndrome uh, was born uh, and when she was born and when I uh, started to understand um, uh, more deeply about representation and how important it was, uh, I, I started seeing that uh, that disability was a part of the conversation about a part of the diversity conversation uh, that wasn't even getting a lot of uh, airtime, mm -hmm. and uh, and people with disability uh, are people, and we're not seeing them on television and in film to the degree that we should like they are a huge and vital and important part of our community and uh and uh unfortunately so underrepresented and uh uh and so i realized when when i first uh became a mother of someone who had a disability i felt out of my depth i didn't have the information to um to process it quickly or uh, in the kind of like nuance and depth that I needed to process it. I had so much to learn. I hadn't seen it modeled. And the reason I hadn't seen it modeled is because it's not on TV and because it's not in our media. Um, and, uh, and so, well, and, and because I hadn't uh, taken responsibility for doing my own learning 
uh, which was another thing I had to realize, oh my gosh, there are, there are all of these areas that I have not uh, uh, bothered to learn about. And that's my responsibility and my kind of um, uh, passive uh, participation in uh, the violence of an exclusionary world. It's me not deciding to look outside of my own experience and educate myself. Um, but I realized that I had an opportunity as somebody who had a platform and someone who was like, you know, to a certain extent considered like, you know, hip and young and, you know, to, to, to show that like disability is part of life and uh, we have a beautiful, joyful, fun family and one of the members has disability. Uh, and so I wanted to, you know, add to that dialogue uh, the other thing, this is a kind of a new thing I've been thinking about in terms of disability. <laughs> it's, I think it's often framed as like a minority issue. And I want to unpack that a little bit because the fact is like throughout the course of our lives, literally every single one of us is going to become a person with a disability right? Like as we age, and we don't want to look at that either, like because of our ageism, and the fact that we also only show like, you know, young people and attractive people and able bodied people on television, like, we've allowed ourselves to like be in denial about the fact that like disability is a fact of not just a minority of people's lives, it's a fact of literally all of our lives. Yeah. And we're like, not willing to look at that. And then to contemplate like, um, how we conceive of um, our participation in society and uh, kind of what makes life valuable and beautiful and uh, um, uh, what makes community supportive and safe for everyone. Anyway, so I just think it, it's a conversation that is not, we're not having enough conversation about disability. And um, although currently I am not a person who has an obvious disability and I am only able to be an ally uh, and uh, uh, learn as much as I can. Um, but I, I will eventually be a person with a disability <laughs> one day and I can also open up the conversation um, yeah. and, and show people um, that it's not a conversation we should be scared of. And in fact, there's so much richness and love and life and um, understanding and embracing a conversation about disability. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, it's, it's amazing that you're putting it all out there. Like I said, it's, it's something you don't have to do. It's something you chose to do and not everybody would. And I think it's helping a lot of people, not only in the Down syndrome community, anyone that feels like they're, you know, they're struggling by not being seen and represented. So I think it's, you're doing something quite maybe larger than you think for people out there. And I think it's amazing. Thank you. I, I think, I think, and maybe I can sum it up this way. I would like to devote my life, my career life and my creative life and my personal life to uh, unpacking and deconstructing and uh, decentering the idea of a normative. Yeah. And if that is, uh, ableism, or if that is like heteronormativity, or if that is white supremacy, whatever has been historically considered the normative and everything else is supposed to be a deviation from that normative, I would like to devote my life to deconstructing that and creating a new uh, paradigm, right, of thought. And I think that all these conversations that we're having in Shondaland and all of these conversations that we're having on social media are just like little pieces of deconstructing these assumptions that are actually violent and harmful to all of yeah. us. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't agree more. We have to talk offline about this because I could talk to you about this for an hour. And <laughs> we gotta get often, drinks. I really, I think it's so interesting and, and I'm with you. Like I often bring a lot of people on the shows I'm on and tell their stories because I want to see them on TV. They're not on TV. So I bring people on that aren't represented and, and that's a whole other conversation, but I love what you're doing. I think it's so great. Um, and because I get this vibe from you, this is one of my last questions for you. Okay. I only say this for the people that I know would appreciate this question. <laughs> so okay. it's a big deal. Are you ready for it? I don't know. We'll see. But we'll see. <laughs> what is a piece of advice that you wish your younger self had known that you think could help people tuned in today? 
<sighs> okay. <laughs> so many things. <laughs> um, uh, okay. Well, you know what? I'll talk about this because I can see it in the screen right now. So, so I wear two necklaces generally, and this little one, this one has the names of my three daughters uh, on it. This was made by a beautiful jeweler named Catherine Bentley. So awesome. She actually made everything I'm wearing. These rings. Beautiful. Um, but uh, Catherine Bentley with a K. Um, and these are my daughters. And I had this one. She made this one for me first. And I thought, I want something that shows like the three little souls that I am here to take care of. And then after that, she made me another one. And it is this little heart and it says mama on it. And, um, and that's because this is another little soul that I'm also in charge of. And so as much as we want to go into the world and take care of everybody out there, and that is so beautiful and that's so important, um, we have to include ourselves, right? And in, in, in the souls that we're taking care of and the little people that we're taking care of and trying to protect. And so you, you, you know, you love others as yourself, not more than yourself, not less than yourself, as, your, as yourself, mm. right? And so we're all part of this. We gotta love ourselves and others the same. Yeah, Arena, I wanna like Super Soul Sunday with you and just <laughs> talk about everything in the world with you. So good. <laughs> A lot of coffee. Yeah, oh my God, it's just so good. All of it is so, so good. Yes, I couldn't agree more. I think self-care and self-love is so important, you know, and that's another thing I do bring up often with, with people on the show. I think mental health is such an important topic and that's a whole other hour. But real quick, is there a way that you practice self-care and, and ways to just be good to your mental health? Is there something you do that maybe could help others? I mean, I meditate a lot. Yeah. Um, that's important to me. And there's lots of different ways to meditate. Um, some people use mantra that can really help. Some people just look at a candle. Some people follow their own breath and they just become present to like the sensation of their breath going in and out of their body. Um, and it helps to kind of still all of the chatter uh, that we often get from outside and to connect with like what actually is and then once you connect with that inside yourself you can kind of look outside of yourself and connect with what is outside so i would say meditation is like a big piece of my life nice nice <laughs> i like that i i for me i need to do my ten thousand steps a day <laughs> oh yeah exercise is key i mean like, exercise for me too you need like dopamine and like all of the yeah all of the good yummy chemicals that come from exercise also very important <laughs> So good, so good. For everybody tuned in who's been watching this and cheering you on and is your biggest supporter in the world, what do you want to say to your fans who are just like team, 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 team Katarina all the way? Oh gosh, um, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> you guys have, really, I mean, there have, you know, this has been a crazy pandemic. There have been some dark hours and like, just being able to kind of log on and see all of the like love and care and the, the way that, this character has impacted people. And it, there's like a circuit of love that kind of comes back to you. Like you put it out and then people receive it and they send it back to you. And it's really dynamic and beautiful. And so as much as they love Amelia, like I, I love them and I am impacted by their energy um, and their care. So thank you. Oh, that's beautiful. Well, thank you for joining the show. I little I could have kept you for four more hours. This is too much fun. <laughs> Another so time. Good. Another time for sure. This is so great. And for everybody tuned in, I'm going to post the interview right now to my feed so you can rewatch.